Welcome into Hitting Heart with John Chuckery here on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Today on the show, do the Falcons fix their offensive line through the draft or through free agency? Why 40 sacks matters? And could Tyler Algier be our next Michael Turner? It's all next. It's Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked On Sports Atlanta. This is Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. Hitting Hard is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. We ask you to head to YouTube.com. Put Locked On Sports Atlanta into your search browser. When you get there, hit that subscribe button. Get into 6,000 folks. Leave us a comment. We are free and available on all of your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all of your favorites, Roku and Amazon Fire. Yes, we are available there as well. Check us out on those platforms and then give me a follow at JMCH316. So when we look at the Atlanta Falcons offensive line, which obviously played outstanding last year, they were a top five overall graded offensive line, certainly dominant in the run game. Still some struggles and some issues in pass protection. You know, McGarry still has his issues in pass protection. But when you look at this thing as a whole, you know, Jake Matthews is still a solid left tackle. He's not outstanding. He's not top 10, top five, or anything like that. But he's still a solid left tackle. Your center position. Between drafting Dolman and Hennessy, let's be honest, you're – you could upgrade at center, and you probably should, but I can live with one of those guys as if, if they are the worst offensive lineman that is on my line, I can live with that. You know, we lived with Chis, Chis, uh, sorry, Chris Chester as our left guard in our Super Bowl year, right? You can have one mediocre to below average offensive lineman. You can't have two, and you can't have two that stand side by side. Can have Jalen Mayfield and Matt Hennessy together standing side by side. Lindstrom, well, he's the best interior offensive one. I don't know how he didn't make first team all NFL. McGarry obviously had his breakout year, and I do think the Falcons will re-sign him. So I don't think that, well, let me put it this way. I'm certainly not signing him if it involves the franchise tag, which is 18 and a half million or thereabouts, it's over $18 million for the franchise tag. So I'm not signing him for that kind of money, but I think that he will certainly agree to a, a few-year deal. I'm not even signing him to five or six years, but we can get into McGarry's contract and all that a little bit later. So if I have Jake, if I have Chris Lindstrom, if I live with the center position, and I have Caleb McGarry, and he gets back in the fold and in the mix – that leaves our left guard spot. So what do the Falcons do? Do they draft a high caliber guard or do you attack it through free agency? Here's what I would do. Okay. I attack it through free agency. So when we talk about a couple of the guys and look, we know about the money, $56 million. When they cut Marcus Mariota, it'll increase by $12 million more. So about $68 million in money that the Falcons are going to have, right? Second most in the league, whatever like that. But that money is going to be used up very quickly. You know, you extend Chris Lindstrom, you pay all the other guys that fill out your roster. That money's going to go very, very quickly. So it probably leaves you with probably two guys high caliber to put money into. Certainly, I don't know that the edge class, I don't want Marcus Davenport and things like that. Certainly the the best part of the defensive line free agency class is the interior of defensive line, right? And if it's Deron Payne or, you know, Hargrave from Philadelphia, you know, I don't know if Hargrave is realistic, but let's just say that if you get into that mix, you're probably looking at $20 million a year, right? We know how great he eats up some good money. You're talking about, you know, potential double digit sack guys on the interior line. So if you go that route for one of those guys, you know, it's probably going to leave you to where, you can sign one additional 
free agent. I go the veteran route for my left guard and I spend some money at my left guard. Here's why. Okay. So I'm looking for a veteran. I'm looking for somebody who is not just average, not below average, and certainly rolling the dice. Look, the last time we rolled a dice, the dice on a guy that started at left guard for us, we only ended up with the worst interior offensive line in the entirety of the NFL. Wouldn't be wouldn't mind having a guy like Nate Davis who played for you know he he was uh, a, a Tennessee Titan um, for the last several years played in Arthur Smith's with Arthur Smith's offense. The projection is about three years and twenty one million dollars, fourteen point two five million dollars guaranteed. Says that Davis earned a career best sixty six point eight pass blocking grade last season uh, in his rookie contract. And then that was a huge jump from the 52-6 that he had the year before. From 20 to 22, Davis' 74.1 run, run blocking grade ranks 14th among guards, routinely getting into the second level of the Tennessee Titans zone running scheme with good movement skills. He can continue to improve in pass protection, round out his game. The former third rounder could be a quality guard for the next few years. I'll, I'll grab Nate Davis and I'll pay him some money. If it's three for 21, got no issue with that. In fact, I'll go three for 24. If it sweetens the pot, I can afford $8 million a year, but I go the free agency route to go get my left guard. As Jake Matthews is getting a little bit older and maybe he needs a little bit of help. And I'm certainly looking at guys with Dolman and Hennessy that probably needs some help as well. I got to be really good at left guard. I can't just be some ham and egger and I can't just throw a draft pick in there. And look, frankly, the last two regimes have not always inspired confidence in me for how they draft offensive linemen, whether it's Thomas Dimitrov or certainly Terry Fontenot. I mean, the last starting offensive lineman, again, he was the worst interior offensive lineman in the entire NFL. Hear me? I can't go down that route anymore. So if I have young center, I have aging left tackle, I'm outstanding at right guard. And I'm obviously, if I sign McGarry, I'm still pretty good. And a guy who knows the system at right tackle, that leaves me with a left guard, I go get a Nate Davis. I go get a high caliber veteran. And now I've got one of the best offensive lines in the, in, in the NFL. If I add a Nate Davis to this group of guys that I currently have, that's improved in his pass blocking. And Nate Davis is a guy who's improved in his pass blocking. They're outstanding in the run game. I can do the same things with Arthur Smith. You know, again, a guy who played for the Titans. If I can have all that, I fixed that. And again, we talked about this last week. The three things that I have to be outstanding at, my quarterback, offensive line, defensive line. Until some of those things change, things are not going to improve as far as a winning record and being a playoff caliber team. So I go the veteran free agent route. Let me target a Nate Davis. I'll give him a, a nice pile of money. Give him three, four years, seven, eight million dollars a year, and let's roll. And I go that route versus plopping in a draft pick, even if it's a high caliber pick, even if it's a guy who's first or second round. I'm still not going to go down that route with my issues, you know, at center. And again, you know, hopefully that that position gets a little bit better, whether it's Dolman or Hennessy, that position gets a little bit better. But give me a guy that's a high caliber veteran, free agent at my interior offensive line, and let's go full tilt boogie on all of it. All right, let's talk about my friends over at FanDuel. Listen, we're excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because FanDuel is the number one sports book in America. It's really simple. Listen, if you're new to FanDuel, we've got a great deal for you. We've got so many great features that we make sports betting fun, easy. So right now at FanDuel, when you sign up today, download FanDuel. You can get the no-sweat first bet. You can get as much as 
$3,000 in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. So place a wager. If it doesn't win, you can qualify for as much as $3,000 on your bonus bet. So FanDuel lets you bet on everything from money lines, point spreads, who's going to score a touchdown. Obviously, it's a safe, secure, easy-to-use app. Best of all, you get your winnings paid instantly. So head to FanDuel.com slash locked on today. FanDuel.com slash L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N to claim your no-sweat first bet and bet on Super Bowl 57. FanDuel.com slash locked on L-O-C-K-E-D. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL. So you know how I've always, radio, podcast, I always bring up the 40 sack number, right? I always talk about that's the magical number to be a playoff caliber defense, right? Okay, so I was doing some research as I'm random to do, and I just, you know, kind of pull numbers out and I start looking and say, hmm, okay, does this confirm what, I, what I'm thinking and all that kind of stuff? Okay, so... The last, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years. So from 2016 until this past season, right? Just finished up the playoffs here, and we're in the Super Bowl now with Kansas City and Philadelphia, right? The past seven seasons, teams that registered 40 or more sacks have made the playoffs 58.9% of the time. So basically 60% of the playoff teams for the last seven years are 40 sack teams. Now I said, well, what if we expand it just slightly? Okay. What, what if we kind of think a little bit outside the box? So teams that register 39 or 38 sacks. So I didn't go down to 30, didn't go even to 35. Okay. 38 or more sacks, right? So you're two sacks away from that magical 40 number. So it's not way over the top. It's not drastically different, right? I kept it within that realm, okay? Are you listening? Okay. Over the last seven years, 70% of the playoff teams in the NFL have had 38 or more sacks. Let me repeat that. 70%, 70%, it's 63 out of 90. 70% of the NFL playoff teams have registered 38 or more sacks. And even at 40 sacks, it's 60%. So, oh, you know, sacks and all that, that doesn't matter. No, no, that's just all hogwash and bull spit. Sacks matter. Sacks matter in the NFL. You're not going to be a playoff caliber defense until you sack the quarterback 40 times. That's what they, again, we talk about this. Quarterback, offensive line, defensive line, you have to sack the quarterback, you have to be able to run and pass block, and you have to have outstanding quarterback play. You can't win in the NFL without it. And here's the numbers. And and I could go back even further. You want me to go back even further? Because I can go back even further and and do more research on this. But just in the last seven years, it's 70% of the league, of the league's playoff teams have 38 or more sacks. And 60% have 40 or more sacks. It's the magic number. It's the magic bullet. And so when I look at, and I was just doing some, Really quick math, okay? Doing some very fast math, okay? How do the Falcons get to 40 sacks or somewhere in that realm, right? Let's say at least 38 sacks to be a playoff caliber team. Okay, I'm looking at if we draft a guy at the number eight pick in this year's draft, he can get seven sacks, okay? My interior defensive line free agent whether that's Hargrave or um, uh, uh, Deron Payne 
or somebody like that, okay? Let's say they get six sacks. Let's say I get six out of Grady. Let's say I get nine out of Ebicady. D'Angelo Malone, two and a half sacks. Ogan Deji, not counting on him for much, but he gets me a couple of sacks like he did last year. And then the combination of, you know, Carter or Evans or Walker, my linebacker group, gets me four total sacks. So all the rest of that linebacker group gets me four total sacks, and I get a couple of sacks out of my secondary. So let's recap. I pick a guy at eight. He gets me seven. My big-time interior defensive lineman, free agent signing, that gets me six. Grady gets me six. Ebicady has the big jump, and he's got to get nine. Malone at two and a half. Ogundeji at two. My group of linebackers, whatever name is on the back of their jersey, okay? If it's Carter, Rashawn Evans, Michael Walker, whatever they are, whatever name is on the back of the jersey, four sacks, and then I get Terrell, Oliver, whatever. If it's, you know, Hawkins, Grant, that gets me two sacks. That all gets me to 38 and a half sacks. Now, I didn't have anybody on here that gets me 10, 12, 14 sacks, right? I'm not saying I won't take it. Not saying that I wouldn't love to have it, but you can get there with this. That There is math involved in this. How can I get it? Now, that requires hitting home runs on your free agent hire or, or on your free agent signing. That requires hitting a home run on Ebicady. That requires a number eight pick in the draft that is a sack guy. Not cornerback playing 10 yards out here. Not wide receiver playing 10 yards out here. It requires a guy whose job is to sack the quarterback. And I focus my attention thoroughly because, again, 60% of the playoff teams are 40 sack teams. 70% are 38 or more sacks. You won't get into the playoffs unless you get me to that number. And by the way, some of the playoff teams that have, have been less than 40 sacks, yeah, Tom Brady. Tom Brady's had multiple times where he's been in the playoffs and his defense hasn't getting, gotten 40 sacks. So if all if, if the thing I can do is I can just magically transform my roster to have the greatest, most important player and quarterback in the history of the NFL. So the single solitary most important player to have on an NFL roster, if I can pull one of those guys magically that plays quarterback, sure, we can be a 30-sack team because Tom Brady and the Patriots have done it multiple times. Short of that, you better be a 40-sack defense. And that's why I always point to that number. 40 sacks, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. I wish I was 40 years old again. That'd be a long time ago out there. But you've got to be a 40-sack team in today's NFL if you want to be a playoff-caliber defense. All right, besides making Hitting Hard with John Trucker your first listen every day, make sure you make Locked On Sports today your second listen, the biggest stories of the day, instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day available spotify youtube apple wherever you get all of your podcasts from so <laughs> was thinking about this the other day can tyler algier be our next michael turner now okay let's let's start with the basics okay first off michael turner was a free agent signing i'm not talking about how they acquire him in this net Algier was a fifth-round pick. Michael Turner was a free agent signing. He came over from the San Diego Chargers. He hadn't had a lot of tread off the tire, was LaDainian Tomlinson's backup, and he came over here, and right out of the gate in 2008, he had 1,800 yards. And I think it was, I think it was 1,800 yards and 16 touchdowns, something like that, but it was a huge year. But the thing that he did is with our rookie quarterback in Matt Ryan at that time. What he did is solidify our offense. And again, a young quarterback or rookie quarterback's best friend is a solid running game. 
And if you want to take pressure off of Desmond Ritter, or listen, I've talked before about the idea of I'm not opposed to drafting C.J. Stroud if it comes down to the number eight pick and I can get my hands on C.J. Stroud. I'm okay with that. So whether it's young quarterback, second-year guy, whether it's a C.J. Stroud, a young rookie, second-year quarterback, whatever, their best friend is a solid running game. And look, Tyler Algier had a terrific year. He set the Falcons' rookie rookie rushing record, say that five times real fast, in 16 games and only seven starts, by the way. He accumulated 1,035 yards, three touchdowns. He had a really solid 4.9 yards per carry with 16 receptions, 139 yards, and a touchdown there. Now, I do believe that as we kind of switch from Cordero Patterson to Tyler Algier. First off, Algier is going to start a lot more than just seven games this year. And I make him my feature back, okay? Tyler Algier is going to score more than three touchdowns. You know, we're not having Cordero Patterson sort of, um, how do I want to say, go, you know, like, like grab a whole bunch of those touchdowns, right? You, you know how, like, when TJ Duckett was here, You know, he used to be the short yardage back and things like that. Well, Tyler Algier can be that kind of back. But, but you know, TJ Duckett was a guy who was taking touchdowns away and things like that from Warwick Dunn, right? He was our big short yardage physical running back, okay? So TJ, or uh, sorry, uh, Tyler Algier can be that kind of back. Can Tyler Algier, though, be an 1,800-yard running back and 15, 16 touchdowns. I don't think so. I, I don't I don't believe that his ceiling is that high. But okay, there's no reason why in 15, 16 starts next season, if he can't be 1300 yards and 10 touchdowns, he can be every bit of that. And while that's not Michael Turner's first year, and Michael Turner, I think, ran for even in his second year, like 1,500 yards and 12 touchdowns. I think that Tyler Algier can be that guy that completely stabilizes the offense. You know, as a whole, it was the entirety of our run game last year, right? Caleb Huntley, Tyler Algier, Cordero Patterson. It was a three-headed monster. And as we moved on through the season, we saw Tyler Algier grow and grow and grow into that role, becoming more of the feature back, not trying to burn out Cordero Patterson, right? I think when you turn Tyler Algier loose, you know, he was a very productive running back in college. Very productive. Remember, he played with Zach Wilson at BYU. And look, They were an outstanding run team, and it's no small part that Tyler Algier in his production, you know, certainly helped out his quarterback, and I'm not going to say that he made, you know, Zach Wilson into the number or whatever it was, two or three pick in the NFL draft, but he really stabilized that offense when he was at BYU. You know, he was a guy that accumulated a lot of yards. I think he had 2,500 yards in two years and like 25 touchdowns at BYU in his last couple of seasons. So the role that Tyler Algier plays in this offense could be the same as what Michael Turner did. It may not be the gaudy stats, because Michael Turner's first year was ridiculous. But if I'm a guy, if if I'm, if I'm if Tyler Algier's production can be 1,350 yards, on 4.9 yards per carry, and he can be 10 touchdowns, that that will be Michael Turner-esque. That will be what Michael Turner meant to a young quarterback. And if he can do that, whether it would be Desmond Ritter at quarterback, whether it would be a C.J. Stroud at quarterback, that, that, would, that would be the thing that would stabilize the offense. And yeah, 
we've got Pitts and we've got London and we've got Michael Pruitt, who's the unicorn. Oh, I'm sorry. Pitts is the unicorn. I'm, I get those two guys confused all the time. Sorry. I get, I get Pitts and Pruitt confused all the time because one's supposed to be a unicorn and, and one really is. But anyway, um, but you know, look, Zacchaeus and you know, who knows, maybe the Falcons will draft a wide receiver in the first round. Again, maybe they will be wide receiver. You, you know, like they'll draft all the wide receivers or whatever like that. But if Tyler Algier, can get to that, you know, if he can be a 1,300 yard, 10 touchdown kind of running back at between four and a half and five yards a carry, then that's Michael Turner esque. That's not the gaudy numbers that Michael Turner had his first few years, but the stability that it provides the offense, the, the identity, the stability, and just basically what our playing personality is, right? As my good friend Bo Bach would say, you know, what's your playing personality? He'd also call you a hump well, after it. But anyway, he'd ask you, what's your playing personality? Well, Tyler Algier can be that kind of guy. He can have that kind of role. I'm not saying he's going to run 500 attempts. You know, you know, Jamal had, you know, that, that monster. I think he was 480 attempts in 98. They just buried him in the ground. Not saying you're going to, you know, destroy him after a year or two, but that stability, that consistency, that thing that you can always lean on with Tyler Algier is the thing that this franchise, when it was 08, 09, and 10, those first few years with your rookie second, third year quarterback and a good run blocking offensive line, that's what Michael Turner brought to this Falcons fr uh, franchise. That was the stability of the offense. And then once they drafted Julio and you had Roddy and you picked up Tony Gonzalez in a trade, then we could air it out and huck it around and have some fun and all that kind of stuff. Then, then that's when Matt Ryan became Matt Ryan and the Hall of Fame quarterback that he's going to be with 60,000 yards in the NFL. But those first few years were about Michael Turner stabilizing the offense, and I think Algier can be that. It may not be the gaudy numbers, but he can certainly bring that same stability to the offense. All right, we thank you so much for making Hit and Hard with John Chuck for your first listen every day. Make sure you make Locked On Sports today your second listen. Biggest stories of the day, instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. It's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever you get your favorite podcast platforms from. We ask you to head over to YouTube.com because we're trying to get to 6,000 subscribers. So be a part of our ever-growing community. Hit that subscribe button when you put Locked On Sports Atlanta into your search browser. Leave us a comment. We are free and available to download on all of your favorite podcast platforms. So the audio version, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your favorites from, download us for free there today. Roku and Amazon Fire. Yes, we are on those platforms as well. Check us out there and then give me a follow on my personal Twitter page at JMCH316. Back with you tomorrow. This has been Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked on Sports Atlanta. 